Hello, I'm Michelle LaDuke Catlin. Welcome to episode six of season one of Trude Up, the podcast that invites you to be the change. Today, I gush. I remember a video back in the early days of COVID. A stylishly dressed woman was speaking at a rally in New York City. She was small in size, but her words were big and bold. In talking about the threat of the COVID mandates and protocols, she said the unspeakable. She referenced the Holocaust. As a survivor of the camps in Nazi Germany, as someone speaking out about medical ethics for decades, and as someone who lost her own son to an unsafe pharmaceutical drug, she has the moral authority to do so. But she also has the facts. As the founder and president of the Alliance for Human Research Protection, Vera is no stranger to the horrors of medical experimentation. I think most of us thought that ended with Nazi Germany, with the Nuremberg Code, with the internationally agreed upon principle of informed consent. How could anyone argue with the idea that we have a right to accurate information and choice around what goes into our bodies. During the COVID times, this basic human right was dismissed, even ridiculed, with breathtaking ease, and Vera saw it coming. Many survivors of authoritarian regimes saw it coming. They recognized the early signs when most of us couldn't imagine something so nefarious. Because of Vera's own harrowing past, Along with her advocacy, she saw the tiptoe to totalitarianism. And so did many fellow Holocaust survivors, their children and their grandchildren. Vera took on interviewing many of these people for her documentary series, Never Again is Now Global. I cannot recommend this free docu-series enough, and I'll include a link to it along with my lessons learned in the show notes. You will hear interviews and perspectives that you won't hear anywhere else. You will see for yourself the haunting parallels between the early years of Nazi Germany and the normalization of medical tyranny we've seen these past few years. Perhaps the best thing about the COVID crisis was that it exposed what has been going on for years, for decades, for centuries. The use of human beings, including children, as lab rats in dangerous medical research. The use of propaganda to manipulate a population into its own destruction the use of fear to compel us to comply. Vera Sharav was a young girl when she made the journey to America, but she never forgot the lessons she learned in those first harrowing years. She understands the nature of creeping authoritarianism, and rather than be victimized by her history, she became a maverick and a warrior. She is a heroine to me, and she is my guest today on Trued Up. So... First, I just have to say that I am absolutely delighted to be in a conversation with you. You know, I first saw you at the beginning of the COVID crisis in a little video that went viral. You were speaking at in New York at a rally. Oh. I had no idea who you were. Who is that woman? And for me, you're like a warrior goddess. And I, I just, the whole premise of my show is to have people speak to their heroes to see to recognize themselves mm -hmm. to see what it is that inspires those people that we can see in ourselves so that we stand up and take action so i first just have to start with you're my hero i really thank you very much um i'm not really used to doing this as quote a holocaust survivor you see i mean i have done things in my life uh, for, you know, uh, human rights, but not as a Holocaust survivor. People didn't really know it unless they knew my background. But with COVID, this came right to the foreground. You know, I recognized immediately the big lie. So and let's, yeah. What is it you recognized? How did you see it? Well, you know, I live in New York City, 
which I used to call the center of the universe. Of course. Of course, New Yorkers are like that, right? <laughs> but not, and not exactly now. And so we were the epicenter of COVID in 2020, March and April. And what didn't make sense, it just didn't make sense. I mean, relatives from Israel told me, oh, my goodness, Central Park is now a hospital. And I said, what? You know, all these kind of rumors, which were actually articulated by all the media. Oh, my God, you know, everybody is dying in New York. But there were a few women. I, I don't know them. I don't know who they are. But they went with those iPhones with the and did videos of empty yeah. hospitals. When I saw that, I said, that's it. This is, a, mm -mm. This is not what we're being told. And that's it. You know, I just didn't believe it. any. you know, I, I realized that this is something else entirely. And I know I had arguments with a very good friend who's a doctor who did fall for it at the beginning. Absolutely. She said, oh, my God, no, this is this is really, you know, and, and she has a lot of experience with, you know, with really nefarious stuff. Um, military, you know, the anthrax and all that. Um but I didn't buy it. I realized it was a lie. You know, why would they have to lie to us? It, it's just, you see, it doesn't make sense. Why do you have to lie to people that people are dying all over? Well, eventually, we did find out the truth, which was they sent everyone to three hospitals, and all the others were empty. It's a very, you know, a good way to create panic and maintain panic. And then... Uh, I also quickly, rather quickly, and, and in part, well, my husband, who had been ill for a very long time, and he was in an assisted living center, and for three weeks I couldn't see him. The lockdown. And he died. They did let me come the last two days. But, but I realized also what was happening with the elderly. And I began, and I then learned about Andrew Cuomo, who was then governor, who issued the order to hospitals not to treat the elderly, to send them to nursing homes. And before he issued the order, he predicted this virus in nursing homes will be like fire through dry grass. Well, I began to talk about that. And everyone tried to shut me. Oh, no, no, no. He, he didn't. He, you don't mean that he meant. I said, if these are his words. I'm quoting verbatim. I'm not making it up. And really, within the <laughs> freedom movement, I had people trying to tell me, no, no, don't go that far. They, this is not, you know, that I recognized it because I knew about the T4 program in Nazi Germany, which cleaned out. First, it was the babies and young children under the age of three who were disabled in some way. And then it was the older children. And then it was all the mental patients. And then it was the nursing home patients. So, so I want to I wanna just interject there because for many people, they may not know about the comparison with Nazi Germany. They may not know about... Uh, your background as a Holocaust survivor, they may not have put these things together. For me, as someone who's not Jewish, when I first started to hear that, you know, it was the same reaction that many people had. It's like, oh, can, can you do that? Can you make that comparison? Because, because the Holocaust is so horrific, so unimaginable. You said something... Uh, in Georgia, in Savannah, at the Children's Health Defense Conference that really struck me, that the Holocaust, it's like that people relate to it as something that is, you said it's like something you bring out for, you know, for holidays to... For, for memorials. For, for memorials. memorials. And uh, that's not what it's about. That's not what never again means. I'm so sorry, but this is one of those things I have to get rid of. I'm on a Zoom. I can't talk to you. Uh, <laughs> um, the problem and the issue is that the gatekeepers 
the institutional gatekeepers of the Holocaust have essentially done exactly what is going on with COVID, where government agencies and anyone that they support, which is, you know, all the pharmaceutical, the hospitals, everyone, they're all adhering to a single narrative. You are not allowed to veer away from it. The same thing is true with Holocaust memorials. And as I say, the gatekeepers who have an iron grip on the storyline. And the storyline is that nothing before or since the Holocaust may be compared to the Holocaust. Well, what I recognize what they're doing is making the Holocaust irrelevant, irrelevant to history and irrelevant to here and now. That is a crime against the victims because the victims, one of the main things that really, and many of them articulated it, even in, you know, even in Auschwitz, they buried uh, what were like diaries of those, by those who had to sweep up the crematoria. They wanted the world to know what happened so that it would not happen again, so that they would recognize the signals before it, you know, before it evolved. After all, the final solution took nine years. Hitler was in, he was a dictator already nine years, but he did everything very slowly, very methodically, got people used to more, each step more evil, each step more evil. That's how you do it. And this is what's been done now. So I am, yes, I'm on a war path with both Holocaust deniers, which is a ridiculous thing anyway, but also with those who are holding the Holocaust hostage. I, you know, I got, I still have goosebumps when you said that, because I recognized one of the, I'm going to call it gifts of the last three years, three and a half, four years, is the awakening of questioning, right? The awakening of the ability, the facility, the practice of questioning everything. And I realized that, oh my God, that's that's so true. We have, we're not allowed to touch the Holocaust. Like it's, you can't make a comparison. But if you don't make a comparison, then what's the point? What's the point, exactly. And, and the other piece I got from your documentary, which we'll get into, is that what you just said, that this didn't start with the final solution. No. It started with these little bits. And and when you talked about evil, I really um, got, there was there was one man, I think he was the grandson of um, uh, someone who who helped the Nazis, who said that evil isn't necessarily done by evil people. You don't have to, and it reminds me of the banality of evil. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is just it. The banality of evil simply means that it becomes an everyday thing. And then it's no longer got the, a, a, the horror attached, which, yes, we need to be horrified by evil. And instead, it desensitizes people. And that's the point. Conditioning, desensitizing. I don't believe in, uh, you know, in um, uh, what's his name? Desmond, who, who talks about the... Uh, the is Desmond, yeah. Yeah, about being Mass hypnosis. Yeah, I don't think it's 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 really a conditioning where you are just being conditioned to accept the unacceptable. I I think yeah, I definitely think you're onto something because I remember for me I started writing about all of this when vaccine passport was announced. Right? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Probably get censored somewhere. But anyway. Well, <laughs> uh, I, um, when I heard that, I thought, no, 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 people aren't going to put up with that and how quickly they did. And I would walk around my neighborhood, which had a lot of restaurants, cafes, and I would see people inside and I would look in there. I was incredulous as don't you understand the Jews are out here. Yeah. Right. Like this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, and you don't have to you know, look very far, but you know, Israel was right in the foreground of it. Why do you think that is? Uh, well, okay, there are several reasons, but one reason is that 
Israelis really trust their healthcare system. They have had it, you know, for 40 years, and they're perfectly happy with it. So they trust it. They trust the doctors. They trust the health officials of the government. They could not conceive that they would be part of an evil thing. They just can't. And, and this is, yeah, this is very real. That's really interesting because I think the same thing is true for Canadians. You know, Canadians are very proud of having socialized medicine. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think you're right. That's part of how, why it was so easy for people to go along is that people just trust the healthcare system. Yeah, and this is, look, both the atrocities in Nazi Germany and what has happened in these close to four years could not have been done without the medical establishment. That is the their... People trust doctors. Even though they shouldn't be trusted. Yeah. They just do. It's... Uh, because people actually, whether they are conscious of it or not, they expect doctors to do no harm, to abide by the Hippocratic Oath. And you know that doctors today don't even swear that. I was just going to say that. I only recently found that out. I was quite shocked. And I think people need to understand that, mm-hmm. that they don't take that oath anymore. No, they don't. And, um, and the, uh, well, the, the, I would say the, the one thing, the one positive thing that came out of the Nuremberg trials, only one thing really, and that's after the doctor's trial, which is the Nuremberg Code. And I recommend really that people get a copy of it. We actually put something together and we'll do another one uh, just from our organization. People need to really have that with them. It is a legal and moral document of human rights. What everything about the COVID shots is totally at odds with the Nuremberg Code. Absolutely. Nobody got real informed consent, voluntary informed consent. That is such an important, uh, it's, it's a right that, all other rights kind of stem from it. If you if you are not informed in great detail about what's in those shots, what's the evidence of safety? They're just saying safe and effective. What does that mean? And it's actually the the shocking part is that nobody. If you go to a doctor and they prescribe a drug, they will tell you. Here's the potential side effects so that you can choose whether to, or surgery, you know, you choose, okay, well, that risk is worth it to me. That is not, but here, nothing, nothing. And the doctors don't know either. That's the other part. The doctors don't know what's in it. The, the package insert is blank. Now, nobody in their right mind should put themselves at risk this way. If, if they don't tell you what's in it, clearly there's stuff in there that is not good for you. That you, If you knew, you would say no. So better say no when in doubt, say no. You have been, as you said, you weren't, you know, uh, Holocaust survivor wasn't part of what, you, what you've been doing, wasn't part of your activism for most of your life. So um, I want to go back to what started you on your activism with your son. So can you tell the story of what happened? Well, uh, my son at around the age of 16 started to uh, really not not be himself. He was very confused and and it became, uh, you know, a long odyssey. And I had to learn, I had to get acquainted with the mental health system in New York. And I joined you know, a parent organization and tried to learn, tried to be what we were constantly really uh, told was, oh, well, we will know the 
the breakthrough drugs. Everybody's waiting for the breakthrough drug that's going to solve all the problems. And uh, eventually, yeah, there was this so-called breakthrough drug. It was called Clozero. And now they have a whole bunch of them, you know, a family of atypical antipsychotics. They give, you know, fancy names that sound breakthrough, right? Uh, well, the drug event, the drug is what killed him. Uh, these drugs are, 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 they precipitate all, first of all, they destroy the body. They cause diabetes, they cause all kinds, you know, but also the brain. I mean, what, look, mental illness is a very, very mysterious, really, kind of uh, disorder. Mm -hmm. And it's very individual, actually. That's one of the things that's very endemic now with medicine is they're trying to one to use one size fits all one drug one vaccine one dose it makes it simple right but guess what human beings are not simple human beings whether they have a problem whether they're broken even it's very individual what suits one doesn't suit the other and met the medical establishment has total disrespect for the most important part of our body, which is our immune system. Uh, because in a sense, the immune system can cure a lot of things all by itself. It doesn't need a lot of the toxic drugs or the so-called you know, vaccine. So it's, it, <laughs> the immune system makes the system look bad, actually. <laughs> Funny. It does a better job. <laughs> yes, it does a much better job when it's left to its own devices, when it's given, you know, decent nourishment and has the body kind of, you know, it helps the body function. And it's constantly our army that protects us. You've just given me a whole new context for why they fought natural immunity so hard. Exactly, of course, because if people understood that they could cure themselves, yeah. Especially of something that, look, what I've learned uh, during this time, really, the COVID, because I'm in touch with all kinds of scientists, you know, doctors who really are studying, who are, who do, are knowledgeable and are trying to help us and not just pump more, you know, every six months they want us to take another shot. Uh, the fact is that the whole virus mythology is a mythology a virus that is very lethal is never very infectious the viruses that are very infectious are like the common cold we mm -hmm. give it to each other all day. oh yeah that passes from one to the other but it doesn't kill you the one that kills you can't go to somebody else because it kills you you're dead Dead people don't infect others. Hello, really? That's a real fact, you know? <laughs> no. Bacteria and stuff like that's a different story, but they're not telling us bacteria. No, they're, they're telling us virus. It has that, it's through the, really through decades, even centuries, they've kind of propagandize the idea that a virus is such a mysterious thing and you can't see it, you can't feel it, but if it gets you, it kills you. So therefore you should do all the stupid things like, I mean, and here it's so invisible, but it's okay, the mask will, how will the mask protect you if it's so invisible? It's so <laughs> tiny. Hey, don't you think it can go through those little holes? I've heard that uh, wearing a mask to protect you against a virus is like putting up a chain link fence to protect you against a mosquito. Okay, there, uh, you know, right. Or, you know, Dr. Zev Zelenko, uh, he called them face diapers. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of Dr. Zelenko, 
show. Um, I want to talk about your documentary because this is, I mean, people hear this all the time, but you must, must, must watch this documentary. I've written about it. I've shared it far and wide. It's, it's extraordinary in its breadth and depth. I mean, you cover so much territory over those five episodes, but also from the perspective of Jewish people. And I'd like you to just talk about what uh, inspired the film, how you got into making it, anything you want to share about the whole process. Well, I've never done a documentary before, so that's... Um, and I will say this. Uh, we at first had a larger sort of committee and people, uh, you know, who had done documentaries and all that. And I realized that wasn't going to work because I did not want to have a script or even an outline, nothing. I said, I will go out and interview people and let them, they'll, they'll carry the story. And that's what we did. Wow. And the fact is that, well, some have told me that I had some help from above. <laughs> Nothing like that. Well, the reason they say that is because other than um, Edwin Black, who was the last one that I interviewed during those five episodes, uh, I ha what he said, I said, oh, that has to go right in the front because that'll carry. Now, he wrote uh, IBM and the Holocaust, and he talked about the American corporations that facilitated, that funded, and gave Hitler the wherewithal, the weaponry and the money to carry out, because he didn't have any. That was just it. You know, Germany was not prepared militarily at all. And, but other than that, I interviewed people simply by whatever schedules could be done, their schedule, my schedule. It was totally happen chance. And yet it flowed. <laughs> we didn't have to shuffle. We thought we would, but we didn't. It, it just worked out that way. We had to then decide, you know, the break between, because it's five and a half hours. But by the way, we're, we are going to have a sixth and final. Um, um, so, People recommended whoever knew someone who either uh, survived or children and grandchildren. And yes, some of, some of the grandchildren, it's very interesting because grandchildren have a different relationship with grandparents and with parents. And that, by the way, is one of the things that I think was one reason that they wanted to get rid of the elderly, aside from the economic burden. You know, grandparents, people my age carry history. We tell stories. And that's what the grandchildren love so much. They love to hear grandma tell stories. Well, and, and this is so key because we tend to look at the past like somehow those people were naive or uneducated or just couldn't know how these things could never possibly happen again. And when you hear from real people yeah. and people like you who are actually saying, yeah, this is how it started. It's, it's a whole different perspective. Yeah. You connect the dots. One of the grandchildren, actually, when he talks about his grandmother, who evidently she must've been a really tough lady uh, because she was shuffled from one slave labor camp to another, I mean, to six of them, and, and she survived. And he tells about how when he was a little boy, she sat him down and told him everything. And he was so horrified. He said, Grandma, why are you telling me this? And she said, because if ever, ever, ever you are confronted with something like that, you will know to fight. Okay? And so now here he is. Uh, you, you know, this is not, not scripted. People are, you know, said to me, oh, you know, Schindler's List or this or that. Yeah, but that's different. That's, you know, that's Hollywood. Yeah. Well, uh, it, and, uh, you, you know, it, it points to the idea of some hero coming to save us. Yeah. 
one person who's going to do these great things when really no it's a grandmother talking to her grandson it's every single person telling their stories i think that's a, i i really get because i have a background as a director and i really get that going without uh yeah without uh, without you know barriers parameters. yeah yeah right. no boundaries so you let people tell the things that are most compelling to them exactly i yeah i didn't i, I didn't have to prep people really i mean you know some had you know accents and that kind of thing we had to work uh, a little bit around but really it was it was in their heart they wanted to spill it yeah and i suspected that that would be the case and it was and uh yeah and there are quite a few grandchildren you, you talked about the one whose father and grand his the grandfather and grandmother were Nazis. Now, the, the grandfather was a physicist, worked with von Braun, and the grandmother was von Braun's secretary. And uh, he tells about he and his sister, after the grandparents were dead, they requested FBI dossier, and they found out that it's true, that they were. And he observes that, yes, I mean, that to him, it was his grandfather and, you know, grandmother. But, but as he said, his, obviously his grandfather was responsible for a lot of people's deaths. I think it's so important that we all take responsibility for the world we've created. And I, I found it extraordinary that, you know, in a, in a, culture a time when people deny their own family history or their own mistakes or flaws or bad deeds that he would actually put it forward mm -hmm. do you think that do you think that that's part of how we heal how we create i mean what's your relationship to somebody like that coming forward with that kind of story uh, well, it, it's it's a very brave thing to do, and uh, as he said, you know, with with COVID, I mean, there was division in the family as there is in many families. Uh, but look, as adults, we have responsibility, and I think that a major responsibility is to try to find the truth so that we don't accuse the wrong person. Mm -hmm. Now. One of the things as well that I insisted that we did in the uh, documentary is that we honor the righteous Gentiles who helped, who maintained their humanity. And there were actually quite a few. Uh, I had to choose each episode in the credits ends with five uh, right. One of the things that that I found, which was both, you know, really uh, encouraging, but also uh, a surprise, the people are totally. There is no common thread at all. It's, it's totally unpredictable. Some are poor farmers. In Poland, some uh, one was a banker's wife in the Netherlands who went and met with Eichmann and got him to sign off on saving some hundred children, whatever. So this is terribly important because I see the those people who did maintain really their humanity person to person and in many cases it was to strangers it's like you know in i think in king lear ophelia the daughter who didn't um um give the her father you know this uh really false kind of praise when she had everything, you know, when, when he was still in charge as her sisters did. But then, you know, she winds up with him 
going through the, the rest of his very difficult journey to, you know, to his death. And it's because of her, humanity continues, because if everyone is evil, evil does not beget anything good. We need to really understand that an evil regime is about death. It's about genocide. It's not about re reproduction or recreation or anything like that. It never creates. So I have two questions for you from that. First, you're talking about, and I remember seeing that the banker's wife, the poor farmers, these people, this is the thing that intrigues me, is what has some people seen? What has some people stand up? Because it doesn't seem to be along education lines, you nope. know, financial lines, class lines. What do you think it is that has people find that? The mystery of the individual human being. That is, and that is what they're trying to suppress. They're trying to eliminate individuality. That's what transhumanism is all about. It's the, they want predictable people. And as long as we are, as, as many, as few as we are, that's the challenge for them. Look, even when it comes to the COVID shots, they got rid of the control group because it wouldn't look too good. But guess what? We're the control group. Yeah, yeah. We really need to understand that we are the control group that threatens their entire empire. Yeah, on the theme of the mystery of the individual human being, which I love, um, it's, it's, you know, we don't... Mm, appreciate mystery in an intellectual world, right? It, it's it, like we have to have answers to everything. But it was that mystery that that is part of what had you survive the mm -hmm. Holocaust. Can you tell the story about your instincts when you were a little girl? Yeah, I was on this odyssey essentially uh, to, for 10 months where I was. Um, a child without parents and without anyone really to take care of me. And I had to, I had to learn to assess people. I knew that I couldn't take care of myself. I was little and I trusted adults. I didn't trust other children because they bully and all that. I didn't want to be in. And I, I'd been an only child. So it's understandable that I related better to adults. But here I was on my own and I had to I had to assess who would be kind. And I have to say that throughout I was never abused. And you know, I mean today you can't let a child out two blocks away, you know. Uh, and so on my sort of last lap where after I'd been rescued from the camp in Ukraine. Uh, and I was sent back to Romania, where I'd been born. Uh, the last lap, with the, my final exit from Romania uh, was in 41. Uh, and on, I had to take a train to the harbor city. And on the train again, I befriended a family. But when we got to Constanza, that was the harbor city, there were three small boats waiting for us. And they read off the names and each person was assigned to one of the three boats. And I was assigned to the boat with the orphan children. But I refused to get on. I absolutely refused, no matter what. And they tried to bribe me to whatever. Nothing worked. I just cried, no, I'm not going on that boat. I only wanted to go on the boat with the family that I uh, befriended. And I was left alone, you know, and everybody went where they were assigned. And I didn't. And for some, you know, miraculous reason, they, they gave in to me. You know, they could have picked me up and thrown me, you know, I mean. You were four years old. No, I was I was six and a half. Oh, you were six and a half then. Okay, six and a half then. Yeah, I had been in the camp for three years. So okay. Um, 
But the first night out at sea, while I was actually asleep because I'd been very seasick, I always used to get seasick. So I didn't witness the horror, but the first night out at sea, a submarine <sighs> torpedoed the boat with all the children. There were no survivors, no, no child survivors. I only learned about it the next morning. And I never, ever said one word, nothing. You know, people looked at me because they knew what had happened the day before, how I didn't go, and there I was. But I thought to myself, well, I was right to disobey. But I also felt a tinge of guilt. Um, but that lesson... And it was a lesson. That lesson, even though I was not conscious of it most of the time, most of my life, I really wasn't. But it came back with COVID. Disobey. And what I've actually discovered during this period is that I do have a heroine, not a hero, a heroine. And I can tell you that some people really don't like it when I tell them who my heroine is. <laughs> Goes a little bit against the religion. Okay, now I'm super curious. <laughs> it's Eve. She disobeyed God to give us knowledge. That's it. Now, we have to understand that really, while that is regarded as, oh my God, but Eve is that evil. Now, that, that's what the way the institutional religion portrayed her. But really, would you rather walk around, you know, as a, like an animal, you know, in the Garden of Eden, or would you, you know, knowledge and responsibility? You know, they took their punishment, but, you know, we wouldn't have a whole species. <laughs> but really, the idea of yeah. There there are several stories, though, in the Bible, which essentially underscore this idea that, so for example, the uh, sacrifice of Isaac, that Abraham was about to actually, God told, but really the lesson, that the lesson in the Bible really is, you do not sacrifice children. Because that was what they, you know, that was what God was really telling the Jewish people. Because everybody was, at that time, all, you know, all, everybody was sacrificed. And this story is no, even if God tells you you don't sacrifice children. We wow. really need to think of the, the human lessons that we're supposed to take out of this. Not the kind of fundamental sort of thing, which really doesn't get you anywhere. I want to talk about th that, about human lessons, about the uh, innate or instinctual understanding of our own humanity and our own internal guidance system. Because you had that instinct that, w that you had that experience as a child so that you knew there was something within you that you could trust. How do we nurture that quality <laughs> well you know one of the things i guess that um has been lost especially in america for many years because we've been going along this route for a long time and that is that children until they're out of college there's no use for them really they don't have chores. They don't help the family. They don't, they're like useless, you know? They're not regarded. Sorry, but I'm still on. <laughs> aye, 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 aye. Anyway, as farmers, children and farms have chores in the morning to feed the animals, to do whatever. Each one has their little, they feel needed, they feel productive. We have really left 
children from an age where they can be helpful, you know, to be useless. That is fascinating because I've only ever thought of it in terms of, I mean, I certainly see that, but I've thought of it in terms of the lack of discipline, the lack of contribution that we've, that we've um, taken away from children. But you're right, their own sense of usefulness. Yeah, they never, they never developed that. And I think that, I mean, this kind of coddling, you know, until they're in their 20s is ridiculous. And, and we've all kind of done it. I mean, it's not as though I, you know, always knew it. Now I think about it and I realize that was part of the this, you know, where then you rely on, on nothing to do with family, really. You rely on others to assign a, a value to you based on what profession you're going into. And that's one reason that the most obedient we have witnessed are the most those who spend the most time at universities because they they have been conditioned for more years than blue collar workers. You know, an electrician, a plumber, they make decisions at every job, not just every day, but at every job. A college professor, nothing. I mean, it's you, you are you've got to follow the syllabus, you've got to follow the protocol if you're a scientist. And the same thing with doctors, you have to follow the protocol. And now, of course, government dictated protocols, murderous protocols, and they and they followed. How do we break that pattern? We have to we have to take back all all the different systems and especially the education system uh because centralized centralized everything really centralized planning central it's proven to be bad every time it's you know instituted the soviet union used to do that uh, you know the 10 year program the 5 year pro it was always a disaster and we saw with covid the centralized you know, uh, lockstep following exact, that was disastrous and it was meant to be disastrous. I say it was intentional. This was not, because there were protocols in place as to what you do in an emergency, what you do. They didn't follow any of that. They superimposed a central global, global. This tells you we're global centralization will lead. It makes it easier to do genocide. And we need to think genocide because this is what they're after. They have told us that too many people in the world. They've been saying that since the 19th century, you know. Yeah, it's, it's funny. That's another thing that I had never questioned before. I mean, I did, I, didn't think, and I think like most people, they don't think, oh, well, there's a, an agenda to actually start eliminating people. But there's so many things that we're now, I'm going to say, given the opportunity to question, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm curious as to how we, so we take back our institutions, but how do we regain that capacity to think for ourselves? You know, it, in a way, one of the things that, um, and I think it's some of the Scandinavian countries where children don't start really school, formal school, until they're seven. Mm -hmm. Playtime. Playtime is very important for children. They learn a lot. Um, they need to kind of have a sense of who they are. And how do you do that if you're constantly told to obey, obey whoever is in charge, you know? That's not, that you, you don't learn from being obedient. You learn from being disobedient. Every creative artist, you wouldn't have creative anything if people simply followed, you know, the dictates because that's a closed box. 
by definition, that's a closed box. That's a parameter and you can't go further. That's ridiculous. It's true in science and it's true in the arts. That's, it's so great. You're, you're contextualizing my own experience because my background was as a story director, producer in yeah. lifestyle television. And I remember the limitations of tech, technology, of equipment, sometimes locations at that time and how I came up with the best ideas when right. I had the biggest limitations. Well, this is just it. Creativity is something that flourishes only if it has freedom to do so. Mm-hmm. If it has to follow, you know, in a groove, it's going nowhere. It's just going around in circles. Yeah. That's, you know, maybe that's one of the opportunities of this time. I, um, when I, when I met you at the Children's Health Defense Conference, I asked you a question. And I'm going to ask you again because um, we know now that this struggle to expose truth, this struggle for freedom, it's not short term. I think a lot of people thought that it was just COVID and, you know, once we expose the truth, then it would all be over and, and people have been burnt out. I will put myself in that category. And I'm, I'm struck every time I see you that you are always so well put together, you know, your hair, your clothes, you were wearing heels at the conference. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, femininity, that's now out the window. Well, I you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we need to take back a lot of those things. Watch a little girl, you know, e- express her girlishness. Uh, they suppress that now. They're suppressing everything. And under the guise of making equality. No, we're not equal. You know what? We're not equal. Each one has different talents, different attributes. We're not equal. This homogenization of, you know, equal is really anti-human. We're individuals, and as individuals, we have to be able to express ourselves. How do you maintain that, 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 that time, that care, when you're fighting this big fight? How do you do that long term? (laughs) <laughs> Take each day as it comes, you know, <laughs> and there are a lot of knocks <laughs> all along the way. Um, there, there is no formula. You know, people are often ask, what can we do? You, know, you have to find your way. I mean, really, so much is needed now. So many different people and, and their talents and what they can contribute. I can't predict. Uh, I think the worst thing is to try to think that there is one formula that you need, you know, if only we perfect that, then everything will be fine. No, it's not. Um, People on on all sides, both enemies and friends, uh, they're unpredictable sometimes, and they can come up with something you didn't expect. And if you're so trained and used to, you know, being like a Pavlovian dog, you're not going to survive. You know? How do you deal with those knocks? I think one of the things that holds people back is the fear of having their reputations damaged or people, I mean, as basic as people not approving or liking them. You know, I mean, there are, and I know there are days when I just want to stay in bed, you know? How how do you, over the long term, again, how do you deal with that? How, I mean, you're so vibrant and, you're, and you just speak the truth. Well, look, I mean, yes, we all have knocks. And as I said, I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, not having dealt the best way with my son's, you know, mental illness, I mean, that's a huge guilt thing. But there was, I had no, no knowledge and no place to, you know, to go. That's one of the problems. That when people, and we have, this is life, you know. I mean, there are things that we really, where society doesn't really help at all. But what I've learned, though, is that by being as active as I am now, and because I really feel I'm on a mission, um, I've made a lot of friends 
huge number of friends. I mean, really. And they're all, you know, decades younger than me. So they help, you know, that helps. People, most older people suffer from loneliness. They're losing, you know, spouses. They're losing friends. And they're, yeah, they're treated as useless. Uh, that's, you know, that's a societal crime kind of, because it could be arranged differently. You know, you, you shouldn't have to, ling you know, linger without seeing anyone except maybe the, the nurse that comes once a week or something. You know, that's a terrible thing. And those lockdowns were for a reason. They were to do just that. They got rid of a lot of people, just the loneliness alone. I'm, I'm struck by, you know, what you said about children being, children being made useless and the elderly being made useless. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's really, what I hear is that, you know, I mean, we, obviously we all need a sense of purpose. We know even physiologically, biologically, that people live longer if they have a purpose. What do you say to people who think that it's someone else's fight or, they just, they, they don't want to get involved or like, you know, I, I, I don't preach to people, you know, that way. I really, I don't, there are other people who do, uh, and you know, who, who might be good at it, but it's very hard for me to really be sympathetic for people who simply are willfully blind you do not have to be ignorant and you do not have to be alone, really. It takes more clicks. You know, the internet has done, there is, on the one hand, they steal from us our privacy, our identity, all sorts of things. However, in these three and a half, four years, there are more internet forms where truth is being told. You don't have to be welded to CNN and ABC and the BBC. No. The more, the, the more you listen to them, the more you hear the same, 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 same fear-mongering propaganda. That's what they're paid to do, and that's what they do. But there are other forms, and there are this time around, there are thousands of doctors who, yes, they have lost their licenses for telling the truth, but they're doing it. And you need to look for those with the knowledge that why would they do that and lose their standing, right? Because they care more about their obligation it seems so obvious right you know when when people talk about you know these mis this doctors spreading misinformation or disinformation it's like well what's their motivation and what's the motivation exactly. of exactly who's getting paid for to do what exactly. yeah yeah but that's that requires just a little bit of thinking which every person really does have the ability to do but they'd rather i don't want to discuss it the 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 thing that each one is telling me when they try to talk sense to somebody in the family or a friend i don't want to talk about that really why not <laughs> you know what's wrong with arguing that's exactly my i mean i know everybody can relate to that yeah i, say, I don't want to talk about it don't want to talk about it. That tells you that's willful ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. What What do you think is going to happen next? Well, there, there are a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, again, there's fear mongering on all sides in a sense. But um, they clearly have kind of used up the vaccine route. Mothers aren't even bringing their children for the other vaccines, as they shouldn't, really. So they have to, they're probably planning a, a financial takedown. 
I have one one sort of suspicion that others hadn't brought up, and that is because the question is how long do we have to prepare and to undermine it, to prevent that from happening. In the United States, you know, the Democrats, even to this day, it is asserted that Biden says, oh, the economy is doing great, right? That's their sort of ace in the card. I think that they are loath to do it under a democratic administration. Strictly politics. If they have a breakdown during the Democrat rule, that's, you know, that's deadly for them. So what we have to hope and pray is that Trump does not get elected. <laughs> so you they think would love to be able to blame Trump. Right. Absolutely. You see, that's my suspicion. Interesting. They now want him because, yeah, it's his fault. So when the House of Cards falls, it's not on them. They're yeah. very devious. They're very devious. But, of course, if that's true, you know, then we have a little more time. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges, and you, you mentioned it earlier, um, um, I don't know if it was before we started recording, but you were talking about convenience. And I see this, you know, I, every time I'm in a cafe and I see a young person because I, I pay cash, all the time, and I see them look at the coins and have to turn them over because they, they don't, don't recognize them. Anymore. They don't recognize them. They don't know how to make change. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. I know. So they've been not stupefied is the wrong word, but they've it been is. made stupid. It is. It is. I mean, but this has been going on for a very long time. Uh, you know, my husband was a professor uh, at Columbia Business School, and um, he used to laugh uh, when he gives his students things to calculate, and he would do it in his head. And and then he'd look and say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You, it takes you longer. <laughs> 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 but he used to love to his, uh, yeah, they rely totally. Everybody, you know. So what do we do? How do we convince people that convenience is not a paramount virtue or exactly. value? No, exactly. But that's, they have to learn that. I, I, you know, it's almost, we haven't had those outages, but I remember when there was a big outage in New York, we live on a high floor, so, you know, people, you know, had to run for their candles if they had them, you know, and we had to, yeah, that's how you had to walk up the stairs, candlelight. Yeah, it kind of, you know, you, you become more resourceful when you don't have all the conveniences around it's so true. I just, I, 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 I see these young people and I think, uh, what are you going to do if the economy crashes? I know. Yeah. It goes down. I mean, I mean, they're going to be lost. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's really, um, it's a threat. It's a real threat. And what I find interesting is I get a lot, you know, we, we all do, we get, hundreds and hundreds of emails, but a lot, there's a lot of fear mongering about that from the other side. So they want us to be, you know, it's one of the things with the, those who control the, <laughs> the strings, uh, they sort of tell us, you know, what's coming and they want us to start, you know, being afraid. The, the, you know, I guess the one thing that I did say at the CHD conference is their biggest fear is that we stop fearing them. That's their real biggest fear. If more people stop being afraid, then they'll stop obeying. And if they don't obey, the magic power is gone. Poof. That's really what it is. We need to understand that they are not all powerful. 
and what they're telling us about all the fantastic things that transhumanists will, will do um, and artificial intelligence and all this nonsense. Uh-uh. Those are all, yeah, for convenience, stuff like that. But it's not, it's not creativity. It's not productivity. And it certainly will not give us, ordinary people, a better life. On the contrary, it will enslave us. We need to understand. People don't understand what slavery is. But you know what? Blacks understand it. I've had blacks come tell them. They know that I understand what, you know, what it's about. How do you, how do we have people understand something if they have no experience of it? Well, you know, one of the ways really is if you have empathy for your fellow human being, then, you know, that's what it is. The problem is that people need to understand that what is done to some human beings can actually be done to you. This seems to be the... I mean, right down to the truckers in Canada, you know, it's like my middle class friends had no relationship. That's it. Yeah, it was it was a real problem because they, you know, the laptop class was at home. Yep. Working in their pajamas. Yep. Yeah, they kind of saw it as a kind of holiday. It was it was great. Yeah. In a way, right? Didn't have to. Yeah, didn't have to get dressed. Didn't have to. Uh, drive or however they got to work. Yeah, I yeah. know. And uh, th- and it was a real divider yeah. of society, a real divider. It, it was, for me, really shocking how little concern people had. And they didn't get the hint. When Trudeau closed their bank accounts, they didn't wake up, hey, they could do that to me. Yeah, that's it. So... I- How do we make that connection? I mean, you're right. It's just empathy. But, geez, like, what's it going to take for people to say, well, if that can happen to them, that could happen to me? The fact that they don't think so makes them very weak. They have weakened the species, really. And it's it's the top layer, the educated. They think they're safe. They think their money is safe, their IRA, all that. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Mm-mm. It's not safe. Maybe, and, yeah, maybe what it's going to take is that, <laughs> you know, they, some bankruptcies and things like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, look, I, I can't, you know, I don't really predict the future, uh, but I can recognize threats that I shouldn't follow. That's all. What gives you hope? <clears throat> what gives me hope? Just the fact that, you know, that more people are waking up. More people are waking up. Um, There's a certain aura that's been sort of broken. They're not lining up for boosters, so they know they can't, they can't do the boosters. That's a, you know, it's like a finished thing. It won't work a second time. So even the people who don't admit yet, what has been done to them really and what's inside their bodies that they have no, uh, that bypasses, you know, the, the immune system essentially. That was what it's supposed to be. Um, But, you know, there are, after all, among the doctors who risked and gave up a lot to be on the right side of the history. Uh, they've been working also on trying to figure out various formula mm-hmm. you know, protocols to clean the body. And um, really, I mean, you really have to avoid GMO foods. You have to avoid all those genetically manipulated things because that it would, tr- purpose was to genetically manipulate people. And I guess, I think those people who do have a sense of, um, whether it's religion per se, but spirituality, they are more likely, you know, to find the way to 
overcome rather than those who simply obey, you know. And spirituality has been something that has been under siege for a very, very long time. And, um, well, it's, it's gone much further than it ever did in any culture. The idea that you now are mutilating children's genitalia, I mean. Yeah, where, <laughs> no, where does it end? It well, just, that's, that's, how end, that's how you end humanity. Right. It's, uh, I, I definitely see people more willing to speak about spirituality publicly, openly. Yeah, yeah, yeah because they somehow are getting the idea that this spirituality fills a need. Human beings need to feel more than just, you know, flesh and bones and blood vessels. And I think, you know, one of the things that really inspired me is your your trusting of your instincts, you know, that because I think for so long, I will say I was indoctrinated into being, you know, strictly intellectual about my decision making, yep. um, which always felt like a struggle mm. because, you know, there's a, there's an instinct, there's a, a knowing. It's like when you hear something as the truth and you just kind of, it just, clunk, you know, it just, you just know it. I, um, I want to just give you the last word about anything that you want to say, anything that can help people to find within themselves what's needed to step up, to, to live their best lives in a way that's going to make a difference and forward our own humanity. I know that's a huge question, but you know, I'm just throwing it out there. Well, I really think that, that people should really trust them, themselves, their intuition, their experience, their life experience should have taught them some things. And they shouldn't uh, disregard it, disqualify it, as if all wisdom comes from, you know, science, the science. There's no such thing as the science. Anybody who tells you the science, you better walk out really fast away because they're fakes. Science is about change all the time. What's what's true today, three months later or three years later is going to be old hat wrong. We know very little. And I, you know, I kind of take Einstein's words seriously because he said his, his inspiration and his best work was when, not when he was working real hard trying to, figure something out, but when he was kind of walked away, and then all of a sudden he realized what it was he was looking for. That's and, intuition, okay? And that's the scientist of the century, really, and probably more, because he, he's one of the very few scientists whose theories have not been chucked. He was right about everything. But he did not... He did not look at science as godly or something like that. Not at all. And I think, yeah, there. since really the 19th century, there's been a concerted effort to undermine spirituality and to put, to put it into, a, you know, a, a simplistic kind of context so that you'd be ashamed, after all, if you're an educated person. I well, know. of course, the religion is the opiate of the masses. Yeah. You know? like yeah. That. Hey, what an opiate. <laughs> 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 Think about it. <laughs> Instead now everyone, you know, so you go on, on the various drugs and stuff. No, I mean, and it isn't, it isn't at all institutional religion. It's what you have to find within your soul. You have to believe that you have a soul. That's the first thing I would say. And that's, you know, that is, I think, the real, that's how humanity woke up, that, you know, we, something is, yeah, we are special. No, we're not like animals, and we're certainly not like widgets. And they want to combine widgets with people. That's what transhumanism is. By telling you, we're going to give you artificial limbs and this and that, that's just the front story. The real story is we're going to take away your brain, we're going to take away your soul. And you just need to walk away and say, nope, nope. 
I'm, I could talk to you all day. I want to be a neighbor. <laughs> I want to knock on your door and go, Vera, do you have a cup of raw honey? <laughs> Thank you so much for this. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. I got so many delicious nuggets out of our conversation. People okay. get a lot out of this. All right, good. It was really good to talk to you too. <laughs> Before I get to my closing comments today, I'd like to invite you to take a simple step to stop spending money in the big box stores of billionaires and put your money where your values are. If you'd like more information, please contact me about the Switch Away initiative. I'm committed to keeping Trude Up available for free and this simple step of moving household spending to family owned businesses that make non-toxic everyday household products that you're already buying can help me to do that. And I love a win-win. And for those of you in need of a side income, there's also an opportunity to do that as a brand ambassador for Trude Up. Just contact me at gatheryourwits.com to find out more. And now to Vera Sharaf. In a culture that worships youth and disregards, dismisses, and even denigrates the elderly, there are so few figures of Vera's age and experience held up as role models. But as she said, our elders carry our history. At nearly 87, Vera Sharav is as self-possessed and sharp-minded as anyone half her age. She is a reminder of a fading culture that once valued its elders, something traditional people still practice and something we would do well to reincorporate into our society. As history repeats itself, we must look to those who have seen it before. Wisdom is not learned, it is experienced. It is Vera's very being that is my first takeaway from our conversation. She is also, as I've twice mentioned, as stylish as anyone. I was struck by her response to my comments about that. As a woman, she enjoys expressing her femininity. The way she looks and carries herself may seem like a very small point, but I would argue that self-care and self-respect go hand in hand, and we could use as much self-respect right now as possible. Malcolm X understood this and his followers followed suit. Much scientific research has proven this. In psychology studies, wearing formal business attire increased abstract thinking, and even athletes performed differently depending on what color they were wearing. There is a reason politicians favor navy blue and red. I think that today, in our quest for ease and comfort, we've lost some of our edge. The COVID years took it a step further, giving rise to the laptop class and their ability to work from home in their pajamas. I confess that I'm often guilty of doing the bare minimum to get dressed and look presentable in case someone knocks on the door. But what is the message we're giving ourselves? It's not that we all need to put on a business suit, but my takeaway is that we can raise the bar in our presentation to the world by expressing our self-respect and thereby buoying our confidence and the way others perceive us. Of course, age and clothing are far from the most important life lessons Vera imparts in our conversation. My biggest takeaway was the answer to my ongoing inquiry about what has some people stand up and true themselves up to their values and principles while others don't. It is the mystery of the individual human being. That is what Vera said. She asserts that that is what those who are trying to control us are working to suppress and ultimately breed out of us through transhumanism. What cannot be predicted and therefore controlled is the human spirit. There is no formula for finding our way, our own way in the world. It is a day by day exploration and invitation to be our best selves. That is how we create the world we want, by being who we were meant to be. I'd like to hear your key takeaways from my conversation with Vera Sharaf. Please share in the comments section and stay tuned. Be true to yourself and remember that we are the ones we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm.